Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Reading in my life is re relaxation. You feel better afterwards. Hi, I'm Kath Keneally. Welcome to Sundoku, the podcast for people who can't live without books. And I'm Annie Hastwell. And Kath, we do this show because we love books so much, but it's good to think about why people write books. And sometimes, you know, a lot of it's you've got a great story to tell, but sometimes it's just to get something off your chest because writing has got this amazing cathartic quality. In a roundabout way, that's going to be the story that we're going to hear today from your guest. It is. I'll be talking to Ellis Gunn, who lives in Adelaide but was born in Scotland and raised and came here as an adult. Uh, It's a story she needed to get off her chest called Rattled. And later in the program, we'll take a look at literature through the Viking lens. It's really rich, troubling, interesting, awful kind of subject matter. The myths are filled with gods who are not like Christian gods. You know, they are flawed. They are jealous, petty people. And there's a great sense that the Viking people thought of the gods as their friends. Vikings have inspired so many books, movies, TV series, but actually they didn't write anything down. I think they had runes. That was about the length and breadth of their writing, but we'll find out more about that from uh, Dr Lisa Bennett because she is a Viking expert and she's going to do the shield maiden thing for us today on Sundoku. How fabulous. I have just started watching Be Foreigners again for the fourth time. Speaking of shield maidens. If anyone hasn't seen Be Foreigners, please. (laughs) Alfilda, you will love her. And now to Ellis Gunn's memoir, Rattled. It's a book about her being stalked over several years and that experience triggers her memories of other things that have happened to her in her life. It's quite a dark book, an angry book and a strong book. But despite all of that, it's a beautifully written book, as you'll understand from this extract that Ellis Gunn is reading. I'm walking through a park on my way home, having just dropped my son off at school. Or not quite, just. I've dropped my son off and I've been to the little cafe near the school where the coffee is good and the windows fold open onto a quiet leafy street and a woman with two sausage dogs sits reading the morning paper while her dogs wait patiently by her chair. I've sipped my latte and answered emails and redrafted a poem and then I've gathered my things and walked back past the school, leaf shadows dancing beneath my feet. I've crossed over the busy road and now... Now, I'm walking through this park with its vast beds of heavily laden rose bushes and its avenue of cherry blossom trees, papery petals of rose and cherry drifting like pink snow along the edges of the path. Someone calls my name. I turn round and it's a man on a bicycle wearing black jeans, black jacket, black bike helmet. He's silhouetted like a shadow against the pink backdrop of the rose beds. His bike is also black. As I turn towards him, a rainbow lorikeet shoots up from the cherry blossom, followed by a gang of noisy miners that swoop and dive around the anxious lorry, shattering the air with their raucous squawking, pursuing it as it flees across the open grass. The man cycles towards me. Hello, he says. You're not on your bike today. The wind suddenly picks up, whipping my hair across my face. I scrape the strands out of my eyes and glance round the park but there's no one else here. It's just me and this man. I turn to look back at the street I just walked along, but there's no one there either. There are only the glass-fronted office blocks and the solid standstone of colonial municipal buildings. In the distance, traffic roars along the busier road, but the street that leads from there to here is quiet. Nothing, 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 nothing. Something dark and clotted heaves inside me, but I suppress the urge to lean over and vomit into the flower beds. Instead, I smile back at the man. No, I say, I had to walk today. 
It's true that I would normally be on my bike. Normally, my son and I cycle to school together. I drop him off, go for a coffee, do a bit of writing, then cycle home. Last night, however, my son left his bike at a friend's house, so this morning we walked, a change to the usual routine. Although this man is not a complete stranger, is someone I've met and spoken to on a couple of occasions, it's odd that he would know anything about my usual routine. He dismounts from his bike. Are you on your way home, he asks. Then, without waiting for an answer, I'll walk with you. And so, here we are, walking along the avenue of cherry trees that leads to the other side of the park. The blossoms drift down and catch in my hair. Tiny stones of panic rattle inside my ribcage as we leave the park and cross over the road to a wide, empty suburban street. Thank you. And I was thinking as I listened to that, that's full of your poet's lyricism and it's beautifully written and the whole book has that lovely craftspersonship about it. Is there a satisfaction in that? Does it encapsulate the, your experiences in something that you can put a lock on and put to one side as, as something finished and crafted? There's definitely a sense of release in being able to take all these, you know, sort of horrible experiences and turn them into a, a a piece of writing, a piece of art. Yes, and, and the process of crafting that and, you know, deliberately wanting to make it into something that was pleasant. Pleasant is possibly not the right the right thing, but the you know, to give it the right kind of flow and to um to try and make some of the description beautiful and, right. and that sort of thing was a way of making something positive out of something that was that was very negative. And so for purposes of the book, you immersed yourself in context, history, theory, the psychology of what's going on and the story of patriarchy that still goes on. And in order to do that, you're exposing yourself to a great deal more trauma. There must have been periods where you thought, well, maybe I can't go on with this. I, I think the reason that that I often felt I can't go on with this was the idea of putting it out into the world. I think the writing of it wasn't too difficult, like the writing of the incidents. Mm. I guess were a kind of cathartic. I mean, I don't think of my writing as being cathartic. That wasn't why I was writing it. But there was certainly an, an element of catharsis mm. um, in the writing process. It's more the research I'm thinking of where, yeah. where you really have to think, well, this has a place in a huge landscape yeah. that's very, very difficult to change. There was a point I remember like when I was being stalked where I, I was sitting in the police station and was basically told that this man had appeared again and essentially there was nothing that the police could do. And... I just remember thinking, like, what, like, really, again, why is this still going on? And that was really um, a horrible feeling of powerlessness and helplessness. I just thought, there's there's nobody that can help me with this. It's like I just have to accept it. I, I just, this is just the way my life is now and there's nothing I can do about it. You use the book to take power back to yourself, particularly, I think, by giving yourself those pages at the end of each section where you allow yourself to be furious mm. as well as depressed and overwhelmed and, yeah. Yeah. Writing the book was a real journey for me because, you know, it started as a, a sort of outpouring and then, I, and then I did start to get, you know, angry again about all this stuff that's been going on. And, and of course, you know, because I was writing these little bits about other things that had happened to me in my life as well, things that I hadn't thought about for years and years suddenly popped into my head. And, you know, by no means all of the incidents are in the book. I mean, it's like there was lots that didn't make it into the book because mm. there was just too many. And, yeah, I, I got really angry about that and I was thinking, this isn't fair and blah, blah, blah. And then through research started finding out more about the mentality of, of why people might end up stalking I suppose it kind of gradually started thinking more as well about the fact that the the patriarchal system isn't fair on anybody. It's not, I mean, obviously women suffer 
much more than men do, but men are suffering too as a result of it. And it's not, it's, it's not a system that really works for anybody. And I think lots of people, thankfully, are finally coming to recognise that and that there's a lot being done to change things. You know, towards the end, I started focusing more on look at the huge changes that we've had since Trump got into power, for example. It's, you know, things have, have turned around phenomenally. There's so much that has changed in the world and a lot to be thankful for in that respect. So let's talk about how you do structure the book. Well, you start with a retelling of a folk tale, mm. Lady Mary and Lord Fox. It's sort of a bluebeard story. I loved that you situated the book there to start with. Yeah, that was a, a sort of late addition because I only came across the folktale um, as I was writing the book. And I just loved it, the fact that it was a tale of a, a woman who was empowered and you know took things into her own hands and she wasn't just hanging around waiting for Prince Charming to turn up and rescue her from some terrible situation. She you know went off and did her own thing and did did her own research as to, you know, wait a minute, who is this guy that I'm about to marry? And, uh, uh-oh, he's actually a bit of a monster. Um, I need to get myself out of this. And um, and she did it all herself, and I thought that that was, that was really uh, refreshing. She doesn't keep quiet about what she's seen, and she has her wedding breakfast where she's supposed to be marrying Mr Fox, and she comes out and she tells everybody, look, this is what I've seen, this is what I know about And she man. has the evidence. That's right. Gruesome evidence indeed, but she has it there. <laughs> and so from that story we move into the first meeting with the man and you're dropping us partway along the trail of meetings with him. I think it's the third time you meet him. And then we get that story and we get a lot about your ambivalence and yourself questioning about what your gut's telling you about all of this. And then we dip back into your earlier life and this is how each of the sections go and we get a story that actually, you know, bookends it in a way and uh, is shocking and of a piece Mm. with that story. And then we get a because page where you're theorising and and putting the whole thing in an analytical context and that's how you progress throughout the whole book. Mm. I think it works brilliantly. But I can see how bringing up some of those earlier stories must have been jolly hard to do, in in particular um, because a lot of what we women and maybe anybody who's been through trauma does is try to um, tamp it down Mm. and keep it in a safe place so that it doesn't erupt to um, spill over into your daily life, which you've rebuilt for yourself. Yeah. Too much. And and you get to a point where you you think, well, you've forgotten that it happened almost. And you quote yourself saying to a friend, oh, I've never experienced sexual abuse Mm -hmm. at the eruption of the Me Too movement. And and you stop yourself and think, what? What am I saying? What have I done to myself? Yeah, that's right. And I think that was the, um, the first time that I thought of that particular incident which is described earlier in the book. That's the first time that I thought of it as being rape, I suppose, Uh, which seems incredible, you know, and then, you know, as soon as I started thinking about it, I was like, how on earth did that not, did it not occur to me that I had been raped? That was, that's just bizarre. And yet somehow I think in order to deal with the experience, that's what I told myself. It wasn't rape, it was just some horrible mistake or something. And then there's also, of course, the sense of, of self-blame. We're, we're kind of taught that uh, women need to look to themselves. If they find themselves in a difficult position, then they need to look to themselves and ask, what could I have done to prevent this from happening to me? And so, of course, something awful does happen and you, you're immediately, as you know, I was in that particular situation, thinking, oh, but I was my skirt was quite short and I was wearing high heels and... Uh, you know, it's it's my fault. It's my fault, and then you you start to feel ashamed, I suppose, about it. Mm, and it all feeds into the conspiracy of silence about it all, because yeah. it, it's well, and it's very traumatic for women to dig these things up again, because you have you've got psychological damage to deal with. Mm. So there are several other stories mm. 
of the same ilk. And then we get further along in the book and deeper into your research and you're talking to people like Anne Moulds, who's mm. running a group that is trying to deal with stalkers worldwide, is she? Yeah, Action Against Stalking is uh, the group that she runs in Glasgow. It's a, I mean, it's an organisation, I suppose, I should call it. It's, um, it's fantastic what they do. They have so many facilities for people who are being stalked or have been stalked and you can go to them and they'll they give you advice on they'll look into the type of stalker and they can you know, give you advice on how to how to react and how to collect evidence and what you need to do and they'll have people who will advocate for you and you know if it if it goes to court there'll people have people who will help you through that process and um, or go to the police for you or you know anything that you're not uncomfortable with or too frightened to do then, mm. um, whereas when you first googled stalking it was <laughs> Get yourself a gun, uh, move house, actually move to another country. Yeah. Good old Mr. Google. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you spread out further and look at related things and you talk to Ginger Gorman mm. about her book Troll Hunting. Very similar sort of story. Uh, and in her case, volumes of enormous hatred-filled messages coming her way. You know, I was fortunate in not having to experience that. I, I was never threatened. I just can't imagine how you cope with when you're getting that kind of abuse. And yet isn't it her who says to you, well, the only way through this is to use unconditional positive regard? That's right. Uh, an amazing, an amazing response. And she, you know, troll hunting, is. she's done an amazing thing with that book and... To try and understand where it's coming from yeah. and damaged individuals and who you don't necessarily excuse but you do understand. That's right. And I think it does make a difference. I mean, it was at the point where I spoke to, to Ginger, I was already on that pathway myself. So it was interesting for us to be able to compare notes, I guess, a, a bit in that respect. And for me, it was definitely, it was something that I felt kind of eased my angst around yeah. it a lot just sort of realising somebody who stalks isn't necessarily, you know, a, a, a monster or a psychopath. or anything. There's all kinds of different reasons mm. for, for people doing this. And, yeah. You know, and there, there are people in pain as well. I would really love you to read the um, poems that you include because they're relevant. Uh, that would be wonderful, but your choice. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read both the poems. They appear in a chapter that um, where I'm talking about a poetry reading that I gave in Edinburgh. The reason that I'm, I quote these two poems is because they're relevant to what happens at the reading. But they're from, you know, I, I wrote them a long, long time ago when I was in my early 20s. And they're, they're written in Scots, although I do give a, a translation in the book. The first one's called Time and Again. The clock on the wall says it's time to get the bairns ready, get the hoose tidy, get the messages in, get the tea on, get into bed and gee them as conjugals. There was a time when I... No, there was not. And the second one is called Taking Offence. He says, go on hen, gee's a feel of your tits. I says, I'll ain't have a wank. Or at least, that's what I would have said. Except I thought he might be offended. Ellis Gunn, a very highly regarded poet in Scotland. You can understand why from that. I think of Rattled, we would say it was a vivid and angry analysis of how it is to be female still in the world. And now to the Vikings, almost like gods themselves with their flowing hair and adventure-filled lives and their keen sense of honour. They've inspired so many books. And I, I did a bit of a search and I thought the list was never going to stop. It just kept rolling across the screen. From Highbrow, I found that there's one that did win the Pulitzer Prize, Jane Smiley's The Greenlanders, which I can't wait to get my hands on now. And at the lowbrow end, there's a lot of really racy historical fiction that's had a great time with the Vikings. Then, of course, there are the series. The Vikings series, a bit too violent for me, but very much loved by many people. And then one that you and I both love. <laughs> 
Be Foreigners, which is, uh, it's called Be Foreigners because people are popping back up in present day Norway from Viking times and a great deal of fun is had with that concept. It's enormous fun. It's on SBS. It's an HBO series. We do seem to be more intrigued than ever these days by the Vikings and the romance and the mystique of these people, even though they didn't write. And we seem to feel that we know a lot of details of their lives. Dr. Lisa Bennett is a Viking fiction expert. She even has a book in the wings about Viking women. So I asked her why now, why we are so intrigued by Vikings at this point in time. Now, I think within the past, oh, 50 years or so, I think you see, oh, this is going to sound like a pun, but, you know, ebbs and tides, (laughs) the waves of Viking popularity will then subside and then somebody will find another document or they'll just rediscover the myths as if they ever went anywhere and a famous author like Neil Gaiman will do a retelling of it and so they'll come back to popularity. Um, They're troubling. At least that's why I'm interested in them. They're fascinating and troubling people. The things that we admire are couched in the things that are abhorrent about these people. So in a sense, it's reassuring to have a culture that's so grounded in a sense of honor. And when we hear that word, we probably think about a much later version of honor, like chivalry, King Arthur, that kind of thing, which has its own problems, but I still find appealing anyways. Um, But this is a culture that has a sense of honor that involves honoring your family, your kin, you know, blood ties, even though that means that those blood ties will lead to blood feuds when your honor is slighted. Um, And so that kind of brutality and violence goes hand in hand with a sense of strong family, of being proud of your ancestry, being proud of where you live and where you come from, wanting to do well. You know, I think a lot of things that we can identify with. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to OzcastNetwork.com for details. Still, we just might not um, brutally murder uh, anyone who slights us <laughs> the way that they might have. Mm, thank goodness. So the sagas, as you say, keep getting revived and people just love those stories. But how much mm. can we actually know about what the Vikings were like? Have we just invented the Vikings? In a sense, I think they're always being reinvented. Um, In terms of literary material that we have, um, the sagas that I know best and love most are the sagas of Icelanders. So they are stories of historical figures that were the Vikings' descendants. So in the stories themselves, we see Vikings in action. Um, They go off and sail around the world. They burn each other to death in their houses, doing all these kind of Viking things. And they also go and settle Iceland when either Norway becomes inhospitable because of its king or because there's not enough land to farm or there aren't enough women. We don't really know what started the diaspora, but a bunch of Norwegians primarily went out to Iceland and their descendants wrote about it. So I think, in a sense, that's their way of retelling their own history because these stories were written down hundreds of years after the Viking Age. In, so, a, in a time when the culture was different too, when Christianity yeah, so had taken everybody over. Everybody was Christian at that point. And so the famous myths that we all know at least snippets of. We know about Thor. People have heard of Odin. You know, you recognize that Odin is the one-eyed god. And you think of ravens and Ragnarok and the end of the world. Um, Those stories were recorded by a man called Snorri Sturluson. He was an Icelander who was well and truly Christian. And for reasons we don't know exactly, he recorded all of the myths. Uh, We suspect that it's because he was really interested in poetry. So the Icelanders, the early medieval Icelanders, were so literate. This is not something that we necessarily think of for people living in the 1200s. They wrote stories down. They shared sagas orally. They were an incredibly literate culture. And so Snorri was a poet, and he used the myths to help um, new poets come up with different ways of writing things. So there is a thing called... um, kennings uh, that's applied to old english and um, skaldic poetry which is when you 
describe uh, something like a woman would be a gold bringer or the sea is the whale's way. You know, if you have a limited number of words to work with, you start pairing them in new ways to make poetic language. So Snorri used the myths as a way of writing more poetry, training the next generation of poets. How accurate they are, well, we don't know. We assume they were oral stories that were originally told in the Viking Age, but of course the Vikings themselves didn't write anything down until Christianity brought literacy in the way that we know it. They did record things in runes, um, and so there are images of the myths and the gods, there are the names and things, so we can see that there's some sort of consistency. It's not that Snorri just sat down and wrote fantasy stories. Um, he inherited these stories somehow, but did he make them more heroic, do you think, than they necessarily were? The long and short of it is, from my viewpoint anyways, is that the Icelanders who wrote down the sagas, the myths, had a complicated relationship with their pagan past. They were Christians. They wanted to be Christians. It wasn't that they were trying to return to the Viking way of life, but... They also wanted to be proud of their ancestry. So they had this tension while they were telling the stories of their amazing ancestors of also trying to temper it a little bit. And so there are many areas where they, um, if they're talking about sacrifices or you know, anything that might have to do with magic, they will use little phrases like, they did this, they did something as was the custom at the time. So they just gloss over it. You know, so in a sense, they are making their ancestors heroic, but also turning a blind eye to some of the things that they did so that they can still be proud of them. And yet there's one account that was an eyewitness account. I don't, there may be more, I don't know, but mm -hmm. this is the one I came across. A Muslim cleric who was yeah. observing a Viking funeral, and that it wasn't a very pretty picture he painted. No, so this is a very famous account. It's Ibn Fadlan, who was a diplomat, um, traveling through the area of the Rus Viking. So what we would probably think of as Ukraine, Russia, so much, much more Eastern than the Scandinavian countries we think of um, first when we think of Vikings. It, this is another outsider's report on Viking behavior. And part of this was the longest description we have of a ship burial and it involves um, practices that appear in snippets and other sources but nothing as descriptive as what Ibn Fadlan has like written himself. Like a bit himself. of rape. Um, <laughs> rape, yeah. rape and murder you could so say. So there it was it seems to have been practiced that if a uh, a well-known man dies, then a female slave would get killed to go with him. And before that, she would make the rounds of the tents of his men and um, drink a lot or possibly have mushrooms and other sort of hallucinogenic things. There's a bit in his account that describes her... And I just, I, I'm going to, there's going to be a sneer in my voice, but it's just because I don't buy it, that she looks and sees her family in the afterlife and is happy to go and be killed and join them. Possibly she was if she was off her head. I don't know. I wasn't there. But, you know, so we get this kind of fantastical source of this ship burial that it, I'm not saying we take it with a grain of salt, but we have to remember that this was written by somebody who wasn't part of that culture, who we don't know how much of that, you know, there's the archaeological evidence for that sort of thing isn't necessarily as elaborate as his account. Um, having said that, that account has inspired so many people since. Um, we mentioned the TV show Vikings, and there it pretty much reenacts what Ibn Fadlan has written. Um, so it's really rich, troubling, interesting, awful, mm. but you can't look away kind of subject matter. And this happens all through the myths. The myths are filled with gods who are not like Christian gods. You know, they are flawed. They are jealous, petty people. And um, there's a great sense that the Viking people thought of the gods as their friends. They would say, my friend Thor did this, instead of being so reverent the way that, you know, you imagine someone bowing down before a god. But for them, it was like, I'm going to get my friend Thor over here to help me out with this. And so the gods in the myths are really portrayed in this kind of, 
human but super powered kind of mm. way and they make mistakes and there's lots of scatological humor throughout and they're really crass and yeah I find that really fascinating. There is um, a sense in a lot of a lot of the fiction you read about Vikings too that the women were strong mm -hmm. and noble as well and yet that account we were talking about before mm -hmm. of the Viking burial the poor old servant girl yeah. that did not it was not a good look for how Vikings treated women. I think what do we know about Viking women, do we know anything? Uh, comparatively speaking to other medieval cultures at the time, the Viking women had a lot more freedoms and a lot more power than someone living, for instance, in England in the 1200s or, you know, something like that. They have a lot of ability to take care of themselves. They can ask for a divorce. Imagine everything I'm saying right now has a big asterisk beside it, though. There are terms and conditions. This is still a patriarchal culture. They don't have any rights the way that men do. Their marriages are still brokered by the men in their lives. So they can have choice in who they marry, but asterisks, not really. The, they can say they don't want to marry somebody, but if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. They can divorce, but that ha can have repercussions. And then when they remarry, widows are able to marry whoever they want. They, it's actually great to be a widow. <laughs> you can have a lot more freedom. But asterisk, well, your son can still decide who you're going to marry. You can say you don't want to and have a little bit more of a voice, but things are still run by the men. How do you know this, by the way, if, if there are so few sources of what Viking life was really like? We know it from... A lot of the parts of the sagas that describe family interactions, as much as they were Christian people, life didn't really change that much for hundreds of years after. So the people that wrote the sagas of Icelanders that describe the Viking period also wrote contemporary sagas of the people that were alive at the time. And they were doing pretty similar things. There would be more mentions of the Christian God and those kind of, you can't do something in Lent and, you know, mention of Christian holidays. But life wasn't really that different. So we sort of see that even if there were some elaborations or blurrinesses in the earlier sagas, they seem pretty accurate in terms of the way that humans functioned in this world. So we, we kind of cobbled together a bunch of different sources. In the runes that were written in the Viking Age, that has a lot to do with inheritance rights. So you can see how fights may have started depending on who was listed on the rune as inheriting from whom and who owns this land. So this is where we get this idea that, you know, honor belonged to certain people, women who were uh, inscribing rune stones themselves were magnificent because it meant that they owned that land and could erect the stone. So there are lots of formulas there that say so-and-so erected this stone in honor of a person who may have died overseas or here. They are passing this land on to mm. their children and so on. So if that first name is a woman's name, then you go, wow, she really inherited a lot from her ancestors. So we, we kind of do the best we can to fit all the pieces together into a picture that makes sense. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. And we probably take what we want that suits our culture as well. So Neil Gaiman's the, the most recent one mm -hmm. to retell the sagas. What's your opinion of how he's done that? I think he's done a great job of making it palatable for a modern audience. That might sound like a backhanded compliment. I don't mean it to. But um, in a sense, everybody who has retold the myths has retold it from their own angle, from their own way. So Neil Gaiman hasn't done anything new. He's taken the myths as Snorri wrote them in virtually the same order. And he has translated... He hasn't translated them from Old Norse. He's translated them from English sources into really engaging tales that anyone nowadays could easily read and could see why people are fascinated by the 
by the myths. The characters are quirky, they've got personality. He hasn't added anything that wasn't in the source material, but the way that he phrases things, you can hear his voice, you can hear his style, and that makes it really appealing. Another one is um, Kevin Crosley Holland is an academic. He's done a lot of retellings, I've got a couple of the books here, that are really pitched towards younger readers, and I love them. They sound like a lovely grandpa sitting beside the fire telling his grandkids the story of this magnificent time. And so that's how his voice comes across. He adds a little bit more detail to help people understand motivations of the gods and characters in the stories, but again, doesn't change the, the skeleton of the stories. He doesn't do anything to make us think that this is now a Marvel movie. They're still essentially the same stories, but the, the tone and the flavor are just so appealing. So I think you're right in that we do change them to appeal to us. I think, again, referring to Vikings, the women are much more prominent. There are a lot more shield maidens than appear in the historical sagas, and women have a bit more power to actually affect change in our modern retellings. So forget what might have actually really happened in the Viking days. We are able to sort of gain pride, whether we're male or female or whatever, yeah, from, I from those stories being retold the I way we want like them to. I feel like everything, even something like Vikings, which is really a fantasy version of the Viking Age, but I still love it. It's wonderful. But it's true to the spirit of the source material. And I think that, for me, that's what is important. There aren't any dragons. There aren't aliens crashing down. I've seen some Vikings and alien mashup movies. You know, they exist. But in these stories... They do try to capture the sense that, for instance, women did have power. Women had a lot of power that is hard to film. They can whisper and they can get their men to do things. So they can drive things from behind the curtains rather than on the battlefield. But that doesn't mean they're not actually affecting massive change in their own time. I think the closest version um, I have seen is the new film, The Northman that stars one of the Skarsgård good-looking men and Nicole Kidman. And I feared because it's American-made and I thought, oh God, they're going to butcher it. And instead, whoever researched that film did a brilliant job of reading the sagas, capturing the strangeness, which is something that most modern retellings shy away from a little bit because it could be something that loses audiences and you know mm. you want to sell books so you don't want to have people scared away from the weirdos and the stories. So the Vikings really stand out because we can interpret them the way we want. They're mm -hmm. far enough away in time. Mm -hmm. They can yeah. be whatever we want them to be, really. I think that the, they are far enough away in time that people can manipulate things a little bit for, you know, a bit of artistic license. But even as I say that, I think about... Um, I have a new book coming out next year called Viking Women, Life and Lore, and I'm retelling in a speculative biography way the lives of real asterisk women from the Viking Age, whose stories are captured in the sagas to a greater or lesser extent. And while I was working on that book, I kept thinking, there are people alive in Iceland today who trace their ancestry all the way back to these figures. So even though they are a thousand plus years ago in our past, they still are alive and well for the people who are descended from them. So I feel like, in a sense, I understand why some people might take issue with stories like the TV show Vikings because it's so outlandish mm. or, you know, might not want people to take things as far as some of the novelists have um, in the past 50 years. So I tried to do it always thinking about those people and what they would say with what I was doing to their ancestors because they're not my ancestors and tried to not make it too wild. Dr. Lisa Bennett talking about Vikings. If you're keen on Vikings, there's an awful lot of material to go to if you'd like to uh, read more about them. You're listening to Sundoku, the program for reading tragics. My name's Annie, christened Anne. There's lots of us in my generation of early baby boomer women. I think our mothers were influenced by the Queen and Princess Anne. I remember as a kid, we'd just moved to Canberra. I was about six, I think. My siblings and I were keen to try out the swimming pool, which was so close you could walk there. Mum and Dad said we could go to the pool, but first we had to go and sign up at the library. Well, that was the start of a lifelong love affair for me. 
and very soon I was spending more time at the library than at the pool. When I first heard that real estate agents wanted you to get rid of books before they took display photos inside your house, I was horrified. My house has got a motley collection of bookcases in all but the smallest of rooms, all of them chock-a-block, and when I look at real estate photos and I can't see any bookcases or books, I think, there's something wrong with this picture, and I think, I could never buy that place, there's nowhere to put my books. My Auntie Esther, who lived alone in a house full of books, was a great reader. At the age of 97, she finally had to go into a nursing home and had to leave most of her books behind. The nice neighbours who helped her move packed them into big gar bags and left them on their front porch for me to collect if I wanted them. Well, of course, I had no room for most of them, but I told Essie that I took them all. In the end, she died at the age of 98, not from any disease, but because, this is my theory, she couldn't read anymore. She'd pretty well gone blind. She'd lost her greatest pleasure in life, so what was the point of going on? And remember, if you'd like to share your reading history and reading habits, get in touch. You can record yourself using what you just heard as a guide and send an MP3 to sundokucast at gmail.com. Time for us to go. I'm Annie Hestwell. And I'm Kath Keneally. Catch you next time. This podcast is produced by four book addicts refusing treatment. Kath Keneally. Michaela Andreev. Sarah Martin. And me, Annie Hastwell. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. If you want to know more about the books and authors featured in this episode, check out the show notes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at SundokuCast. That's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U cast. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.